hi guys. It is a lovely but a little chilly day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization out here in Garfield, Texas on this chilly uh, Wednesday morning, November 14th, 2018. So it is time for me to bring you our daily chronicle of the collapse. And I want to thank several alert uh, listeners who have uh, sent me this story. The latest from our old friend George Monbio. Is that how you pronounce? I think that's how you pronounce George's last name. You know, he is a, a columnist for The Guardian, and this is his. His column just came out this morning, which I'm sure is being spread all around down here in the collapse uh, rabbit hole. And I'm going to put the link to this story and highly uh, suggest that you just read it yourself. But if you want to sit around and listen to me read it, I'll be happy to do that. And then they also, I noticed, they have this thing which I've signed up for that uh, you can click on this link and they will just automatically email you the the guardian will automatically email you their environmental stories so i've signed up for that and recommend you do the same but we're without further ado put the little dog put the little dog back to bed here and we're going to see what's on george monbio's mind as the planet collapses here on November 14, 2018. Take it away, George. <clears throat> the Earth is in a death spiral. It will take radical action to save us, as climate breakdown could be rapid and unpredictable. We can no longer tinker around the edges and hope minor changes will avert collapse. So I guess George is still under the impression that major changes, which will never happen, will avert the collapse. Okay. Uh, I love the, the picture here. The picture of the skeleton the, the, the skeleton sticking his fingers in his ears. The slug line to the picture is tipping points are likely to remain invisible until we have passed them. We can see changes of state so abrupt and so profound that no continuity can be safely assumed. That illustration was by Ben Jennings, by the way. Okay, let's dive into the story. <clears throat> it was a moment of the kind that changes lives at a press conference held by climate activist Extinction Rebellion last week. Two of us journalists pressed the organizers on whether their aims were realistic. They have called, for example, for UK carbon emissions to be reduced to net zero by 2025. Wouldn't it be better, we asked, to pursue some intermediate aims? A young woman called Lisa Wolf stepped forward. She had not spoken before, but the passion, grief, and fury of her response was utterly compelling. Quoting Lisa, What is it that you are asking me as a 20-year-old to face and to accept about my future and my life? This is an emergency. We are facing extinction. When you ask questions like that, what is it you want me to feel? Close quote. We had no answer for the the twenty year olds. Ah, uh, you know the only answer I guess is I'm sorry and I'm glad I'm not in my twenties. <clears throat> okay, getting back to George. 
softer aims might be politically realistic, but they are physically unrealistic. Only shifts commensurate with the scale of our existential crises have any prospect of averting them. Hopeless realism, tinkering at the edges of the problem, got us into this mess. It will not get us out. Public figures talk and act as if environmental change will be linear and gradual, but the Earth systems are highly complex, and complex systems do not respond to pressure in linear ways. When these systems interact, because the world's atmosphere, oceans, land surfaces, and life forms do not sit placidly within the boxes that make study more convenient, their reactions to change becomes highly unpredictable. Small perturbations can ramify wildly. I love that word, ramify. Small perturbations can ramify wildly. Tipping points are likely to remain invisible until we have past them. We could see changes of state so abrupt and profound that no continuity can be safely assumed, as the slug line of that picture just said. <clears throat> Only one of the many life support systems on which we depend, soils, aquifers, rainfall, ice, the pattern of winds and currents, pollinators, biological abundance and diversity. Only one need fail for everything to slide. For example, when Arctic sea ice melts beyond a certain point, the positive feedbacks this will trigger, such as darker water absorbing more heat, melting permafrost releasing methane, shifts and the polar vortex could render runaway climate breakdown unstoppable. When the Younger Dryas period ended 11,600 years ago, temperatures rose 10 degrees Celsius within one decade. I don't believe such a collapse is yet inevitable or that a commensurate response is either technically or economically impossible. So George is still clinging to the hopium. Uh, you know, guys, I just, you know, what, what is it going to take for George Monbiot to finally throw in the towel? But anyway, this is George's uh, rant, not mine. <clears throat> I don't believe such a collapse is yet inevitable or that a commensurate response is either technically or economically impossible. When the U.S. joined the Second World War in 1941, it replaced a civilian economy with a military economy within months. And then he talks a, you know, the, the, the usual, we, we, we've heard it before, George, about how all these car makers switch from making cars to bombs. <clears throat> back to, uh, back to George. The problem is political. A fascinating analysis by the social science professor Kevin McKay contends that oligarchy, has been a more fundamental cause of the collapse of civilizations than social complexity or energy demand. Control by oligarchs, uh, McKay argues, thwarts rational decision making because the short-term interests of the elite are radically different 
to the long-term interests of society. This explains why past civilizations have collapsed despite possessing the cultural and technical know-how needed to resolve their crises. Economic elites which benefit from social dysfunction block the necessary solutions. The oligarchic control of wealth, politics, media, and public discourse explains the comprehensive institutional failure now pushing us towards disaster. Think of Donald Trump and his cabinet of multi-millionaires, the influence of the Koch brothers in funding right-wing organizations, the Murdoch Empire and its massive contribution to climate science denial, or the oil and motor companies whose lobbying prevents a faster shift to new technologies. It's not just governments that have failed to respond, though they have failed spectacularly. Public sector broadcasters have systematically shut down environmental coverage while allowing the opaquely funded lobbyists that masquerade as think tanks to shape public discourse and deny what we face. Academics, afraid to upset their funders and colleagues, have bitten their lips. Even the bodies that claim to be addressing our predicament remain locked within destructive frameworks Last Wednesday, I attended a meeting about environmental breakdown at the Institute for Public Policy Research. Many people in the room seemed to understand that continued economic growth is incompatible with sustaining the Earth's systems. As the author Jason Hickel pointed out, I'm assuming he's talking about at this meeting, a decoupling of rising GDP from global resource use has not happened and will not happen. While 50 billion tons of resources used per year is roughly the limit the Earth systems can tolerate the world is already consuming 70 billion tons. At current rates of economic growth, this will rise to 180 billion tons by 2050. Maximum resource efficiency coupled with massive carbon taxes would reduce this at best to 95 billion tons, still way beyond environmental limits. Green growth, green growth, as members of the Institute appear to accept, is physically impossible. Yet, on the same day, the very same institute amounts announced a major new economics prize for, quote, ambitious proposals to achieve a step change improvement in the growth rate, close quote. It wants ideas that will enable economic growth rates in the UK at least to double. The announcement was accompanied by the usual blah, blah, blah about sustainability, but none of the judges of the prize has a discernible record of environmental interest. 
those to whom we look for solutions trundle on as if nothing has changed, as if the accumulating evidence has no purchase on their minds. Decades of institutional failure ensures that only unrealistic proposals, the repurposing of economic life with immediate effect, now has a realistic chance of stopping the planetary death spiral. Yes. Uh, any, anyway, uh, I'm, I'm going to leave this to George to finish out. Uh, and only those who stand outside the failed institutions can lead this effort. Two tasks need to be performed simultaneously, throwing ourselves at the possibility of averting collapse, as Extinction Rebellion is doing, slight though this possibility may appear, and secondly, preparing ourselves for the likely failure of these efforts, meaning these efforts at averting collapse, terrifying as this prospect is, both tasks require a complete revision of our relationship with the living planet. Because we cannot save ourselves without contesting oligarchic control, the fight for democracy and justice and the fight against environmental breakdown are one and the same. Do not allow those who have caused this crisis to define the limits of political action. Do not allow those whose magical thinking got us into this mess to tell us what can and cannot be done. Okay, George. Tell us how we are supposed to do not allow this collapse to go right on uh, unfolding. Uh, anyway, I'm trying to uh, line up some interviews with uh, folks from this newest movement, Extinction Rebellion, uh, to talk to us here on Collapse Chronicles. So I'll, hopefully we'll be bringing you more uh, information on this latest pathetic uh, a, a attempt to turn this freight train around. And with that, I'm going to go check on my poor little uh, baby lettuce plants to see how they fared in the first hard freeze uh, of 2018 here in the great state of Texas. So I'm going to get out there to my garden while I still can, and I suggest you do the same while you still can. Bye, guys.